So, how would Sadhguru define his style? If you don't do anything significant, at least do your goddamn life in style. I'm not a dead, wait for some more time before you define me. Do you think self-love is selfish? Self-love means you're making one into two. You need either a psychiatrist or an exorcist. <laughs> so you mean I need a psychiatrist? No, no, maybe an exorcist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Be nervous. Oh my God, you want me to interview? So I'm not as dangerous as I look. Some of us marry our passion. Some of us marry a person. What is better? You'll make me very unpopular now. No. <laughs> <laughs> we have to have some fun. I am a super passionate human being. Unfortunately, passion people think is only about towards somebody or something. That's a constipated passion. I don't wear designer clothes, I design my own clothes. <laughs> That's why I love your style. We're just honoring you with the show. Thank you. I am a yogi, not a king. Huh? You're a king for us. <laughs>
even the textile sutra, even the simple thread has this, that most people wear clothes without ever understanding what goes into it. They think what goes into it is the rupees that they've paid for it. No, that's not what goes into it. What goes into it is the sutra. What goes into the sutra is somebody's life. Just now we've passed this uh, seventy-five years of India's independence. The symbol of India's independence was, you know, spinning of the thread, yes. charaka, which is about that because we always saw a thread or a sutra not just as an element of textile, we saw it as a string of life, that we pack our life into it in some way. This is the beauty and uh, the wonder of handlooms that people wove these threads, I mean the spun these threads and then wove it into something fantastic, unbelievable things came out of it. There was a time when we literally clothed the entire known world of the time. People, uh, you know, there have been uh, certain uh, uh, royalty in France and other places complaining that all their gold is going away to India because of all the French ladies wanting to wear Indian clothes. So much of their economy was just coming over here. Well, that was also systematically broken down, but this is a time for us to build back the power of our thread, because for us sutra is not just a thread, sutra is something that we pack our life into. And we are passionate about all of us here, I'm sure so many designers, artisans, artists, all of us are so passionate about handloom. But now it's, we see this whole moment starting where handloom is being replaced with machine and synthetic. And uh, what do you have to say about that? See, it's inevitable that a machine which is a hundred times more or a thousand times more efficient than human hand will naturally take a certain amount of space because uh, we have eight billion people, uh, <laughs> people to clothe. Yeah. Obviously, you're not going to clothe them with your handloom. And also it's time instead of being a purist where handloom should be done completely by man's or woman's muscle, uh, it's important, I think, what can be run mechanically should be run mechanically. Uh, what should be done intricately by hand should be done intricately mm. by hand. I think we should come to that. A handloom need not necessarily mean somebody has to labor because uh, there was a time when people believed unless you grind it with your own hand, it will not taste good. The person who was grinding did not think so <laughs> <laughs> Others thought so <laughs> They are free to think because they don't have to do it, yeah. all right? So, it is… the beauty of handloom need not be taken away if you bring a little bit of mechanization. If you don't do that, you will become an archival product. You will not be a marketable product because if you do it all by hand today, the cost of it will go to such a place and the product that you produce is so little, it will not be of any marketable quality or quantity. So it's important that we somewhere mechanize what we can, still retain the quality of handlooms, and because the importance of handloom is that it's not repeatable. Each uh, piece has its own character and something that cannot be imitated, like human beings. Yeah. <laughs> and you do a brilliant job of handlooms, the way you style yourself, the way you wear color. So. How would Sadhguru define his style? I've always been wanting to ask you this question. How would Sadhguru define? How would you… De how would Sadhguru define Sadhguru's style? Oh, I'm not in the same clothes all the time. No, not <laughs> in the same clothes. But I love that we put it all together. <laughs> so what's your well, style mantra as they say? Well, one important thing is, uh, this is something that the world's population is completely missing out on. And they're paying a price for this is going for the synthetic stuff to wear on their bodies. We must make this happen in the world, all of you who… whoever has the needed influence in different areas of life. Children below fourteen of years of age should never ever touch a synthetic cloth. It should never touch their bodies because this will affect their physiological growth, their psychological growth, their emotional instabilities. You know very well if you wear a nylon cloth, it… it has a aesthetic of a certain kind. 
This is also getting into the body, the microfiber is getting into the body in a big way. One of the biggest war pollution in water is actually the microfiber. They are saying uh, an average American has about twenty-eight grams of microfiber in their bodies, out of mm -hmm. which you could make two, uh, I think, uh, at least two uh, credit cards <laughs> So, uh, this is hugely damaging to human system. I have been pushing for this, uh, that at least the school uniforms should be of organic material, mm -hmm. but we've all gotten used to… we… once again it's coming back. See, this is the best time to do this because the richest of the rich in the world do… want to wear their clothing like this, not ironed. Like that they want it. This is the best time to bring in cottons and linen and everything because anyway it'll be like that. So this whole thing of going to this, uh, n you know, the synthetic clothing came because you want to look… I look… Uh, I mean, you want to have your clothes very neat all the time. You don't want a single wrinkle in your cloth. That is what has made people migrate into synthetic clothing. So right now, uh, the most fashionable people in the world, at least in New York and Los Angeles, all come with this thing and it's all to stone a little bit. So this is the best time <laughs> So your look is all cotton and you love colors? No, not just cotton, natural fiber. Natural fiber. Uh, because one thing is, I'm made like this, I don't go by anything that's written anywhere or anybody is talking about. I am somebody who goes by my experience. I know what difference it makes to be in touch with the natural fiber and uh, to be in touch with the synthetic one, what it means. So, I go by that experience, I… if everybody is not sensitive to that, they must know at least today there's enough studies, enough research to show what kind of physical and psychological damage it's bringing about by taking in uh, synthetic stuff into your body. As it is, it is going into us in terms of air that you breathe, you're in Delhi <laughs> So this is the only place you can see the air that you breathe, this is a good thing, you know. <laughs> Seeing is believing, you know, you can see it and breathe it. So, uh <laughs> you're taking in in so many ways, the food that you eat is contaminated, the air that you breathe, water, at least the clothing you can choose. And uh, people think uh, cotton is very expensive, which is not a fact. Uh, we can do this thing in so many simple ways, it's very much possible to do that. So those who can afford uh, or those who are conscious, it's important at least one day in a week, at least to start with, everybody, at least one day in a week you wear natural fiber completely, not synthetic stuff, because it'll make a world of difference to the artisans also. Yes. Because if you have to… see, if you have to keep these arts alive, when I say arts, there are over hundred and twenty different types of distinct weaves in this country. It's the only nation on the planet which has evolved these kind of things. Every district in the… Uh, not a state, every district or taluk in the country has its own distinct kind of weaving, dyeing, doing things. This doesn't happen overnight. It takes thousands of years for people to evolve this kind of arts that they want to make something different from what is out there and they weave it differently, they spin it differently, all this stuff. It should not be destroyed, but already nearly fifty to fifty-four of them are on the verge of extinction. Uh, but yes. we can bring it back not by preaching, not by teaching, not by exhibitions, only by creating the demand in the market and you are the market. Your biker look, which I find the coolest. <laughs> was it designed? Was it… Def it came out by default? No, How I did it all happen? I didn't design the motorcycle, so <laughs> <laughs> And the look? <laughs> What's the look? I wear a helmet <laughs> yeah. But there's this very cool jackets over kurtas, which is… Uh, which is so fantastic. I've never seen a yogi like that. It's beautiful. So how did that come about? Uh, I, I don't know. When I ride a motorcycle, you have to wear a protective gear, so… That's all ready-made. It's and all your fantastic swag, you carry it beautifully. You better learn to carry your life well <laughs> because if you… Uh, if you don't do anything significant, at least do your goddamn life in style. Okay? <laughs>
Yes, do that. <laughs> you traveled from London to Kaveri. Please tell us about that. That incredible journey. Well, uh, last thirty years I have been talking about soil and what's happening to our soil. When I say what's happening to our soil, this is the first time in the history of humanity we are talking about soil extinction. That is, the soil could die. What does soil dying mean? What does it mean to me? Because uh, in many nations uh, they refer to soil as dirt. If soil is dirt, you and me are dirt bags, that's what it means. Because the very body that you carry is soil. The life that is happening in the soil, the microbial life which is in trillions of species, this is the foundational life to who we are right now, even in terms of evolution. This foundational life, nearly eighty to eighty-four, eighty-four, eighty-five percent of this is within fifteen to eighteen inches of the top soil. Today, as you know, uh, our machines can plow up to twelve to fourteen inches deep. We plow it like this and leave it open and then we throw poisons upon it, all kinds of things. We have pesticides, weedicides, vermicides, every side and we have lot of suicide because of that. <laughs> yes, the largest number of people committing suicide on the planet in any given profession is among the farmers, not only in India, everywhere. In United States, fifty percent of the farmers have not seen one dollar of profit in the last twelve years. There are many, many instances of whole families shooting themselves. And uh, the highest suicide rate in United States is among the farmers because it's become such a heartbreaking job. It's always been a back-breaking job, but now it is a terribly heartbreaking job. This is because you're trying to get something out of degraded soils which have no life in it. Just by throwing chemicals and doing some magic, you think you're going to do some magic, nothing is going to happen. All that will happen is soil will deteriorate to a point where soil will become sand. What is the difference between sand and soil? If you add organic content to the soil, to, to sand, it becomes soil. If you take away all the organic content from the soil, it turns into sand. So this is called as desertification. In the last twenty-five years, in just twenty-five years, ten percent of the planet's land has become desert. Ten percent of the planet's area has turned into a desert in just twenty-five years' time. This is what we have done. So on an average, about twenty-seven thousand species of organisms are going extinct per year, according to UNFAO. This slide is going like this. Approximately, we don't know exactly when, but probably in the next twenty-five to forty years, sometime down the line, this slide could go into a tumble. Once it goes into a tumble, there is nothing you can do, there's nothing I can do, there's nothing anybody can do, because once the microbial life, which is the foundational life for who we are, if it starts collapsing, life on this planet will be truly endangered. That's how it is. So we are not talking about just food security alone, that is… that inevitably we will face. Every scientist on the planet is… responsible scientist in the world is talking about we will be producing forty percent less food by twenty-forty-five. Forty percent less food. Just imagine in Delhi, forty percent of the people have not eat, eaten anything today. Do you really believe you could come to this function alive? Hello? It'll be total… they're expecting dozens of civil wars by 2035. This year, seven nations are going into famine conditions. World Food Program has predicted in another four to six months, 350,000 children below five, eight years of age will die because they cannot… they have put their hands up because they don't have the money to provide food for them, which they were doing last few years. This year, things have been directed towards Ukraine and they don't have the money, they have thrown up their hands and saying, we can't do anything about it. So, these things are not any more futuristic problems, it's happening right now to us. So what can we do about it? It doesn't take any rocket science to do this, nor does it take enormous amount of financial outlays to do it. All it needs is orienting ourselves in the right direction and a relentless commitment to fulfill that. 
So as I said, last thirty years I've been talking about it, everybody listens to me and they say, Sadhguru, what you're saying is fantastic, it's really great. And I see these talks always work as a nice pillow for them to sleep on for that <laughs> night. <laughs> so I thought uh, I need to do something shocking to wake up the world. I've been… Uh, last two and a half, three years, I've met so many agricultural ministries, environment ministries around, across the world. What I see is everybody knows what's the problem. Everybody knows what's generally what is the solution. Then what is it that they're waiting for? I realize they're just waiting for one idiot to come and bell the cat. So here I am. So I decided to ride. I considered this carefully because uh, Till uh, 3rd of January, I had not spoken to anybody within the foundation. Even the core group I had not spoken to. I had set up a separate group of uh, Conscious Planet. I, saw, I formed a separate foundation. This was not under Isha Foundation. I set up a separate foundation in United States. I worked with them secretly without anybody in the Isha Foundation knowing about it because uh, then all I will get is, uh, you know, emotional <laughs> responses as to how I should not do it. So, when I announced and said, we are… Uh, we are going for this journey, they said, no, 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 next year, 2023, we will do it. How can we do a, a global movement in the two and a half months? I said, we are doing it anyway. But weren't you worried about all the travel? Hmm? Weren't you worried about the travel? See, the whole idea to was to play a little bit of… See, I don't hold any position of authority, I am not a minister, I am not a head of state, I am nothing. So the only thing I have is I have people's love and goodwill. I thought I'll play a little yo-yo with their emotions <laughs> and uh, if I walk thirty thousand kilometers, it's a suicide for sure. If I cycle, also it would be suicide. Motorcycle is anything could go wrong, anything can happen. There are many dangerous moments where, you know, you could <laughs> you could lose it. So especially when you're riding hundred days non-stop, okay, not a single day's break, our volunteers' faith in me is such, there is not one day of contingency either for the man or the machine. Fortunately, the machine didn't fail and the man didn't fail. Oh. <laughs> so, we managed to touch over 3.9 billion people. Fortunately, all nations are responding now. CARICOM nations were the first ones to take it up, the eleven nations in the Caribbean region. Now, the Commonwealth nations, fifty-six nations have taken it up. United States just allocated 8.5 billion dollars for soil health. Germany invested about 4.5 billion dollars for soil health and now That's they're brilliant. coming out with a… European Union is coming out with a policy. We've been working with many of them. The best uh, thing is India has invested about 19,000 crores in this direction. Wow. And uh, the best thing is uh <laughs> We did not run a very high-powered campaign in China because of various reasons. We did a very low-powered thing, but uh, the Chinese government is unfolding uh, a soil policy now. So the world has responded phenomenally well. The work is not over yet, it's just the beginning. There is a lot of work to be done. So we are working with various governments. The government of Guyana has given us hundred square kilometers of land to demonstrate to the world how this can be done. We already have about hundred and thirty-two thousand farmers who are invested in this and their incomes have gone up anywhere between three hundred to eight hundred percent and the land quality has increased, wow. water tables have come up. So just now, uh, the Secretary General of uh, Commonwealth Nations came to visit our farms and she couldn't believe what's happened there. Now they want to take it global. But uh, what we have done in India is scattered, it's not in one place. So, Guyana is hundred square kilometers, one place it'll be done. We may also take one small African nation and do that. We are seeing how to do this in one of our southern states, taking one district or two districts together and completely transforming that place. We need everybody's support because this is… this cannot be done by just one organization or one person. This needs… this needs a generation support. This is a generational work. Because in this generation, we have this great challenge that soil could go extinct. At the same time, we have this privilege that we could be that generation which turned back from the brink of a disaster. Or we could be that generation that walked into the disaster and cry about it later. 
because we are known for this. We always walk into disasters and then cry about it. Say for example, World War I happened, everybody cried, never again another war should happen. They made some League of Nations, this, that. Within twenty-five, thirty years, you know, the number two happened, all right? No, don't mistake me when I say number two. We're talking about World War II <laughs> And uh, that was far more horrendous than World War I. Then we said, never again we're going to have another war, this is it. How many have happened since then? We said, twentieth century, bunch of idiots, they fought wars. Twenty-first century, we are technology, we are information, nonsense, everything. In twenty-first century, how many wars? Without a let-up, it's happening. Always we are saying, my war is better than your war, that's the whole problem. <laughs> when you wage a war, that's a wrong war, when I wage the war, it's the right war. There is no end to this. And anybody should be stupid to think all these armaments and military equipment is being produced not to be ever used. You must be just plain dumb stupid to think so. It has to be used somewhere. Hello? Hello? Many of you are in business, suppose you are making guns and bullets, you want it to be used or not used? You want it to be used, just not on me, that's all <laughs> <laughs> We all love you, no one would do that <laughs> You're a visionary, you're magical, you're, you're fearless, you are just… Uh, you're phenomenal, I'm a fanboy. But how would Sadhguru define Sadhguru? I'm not a dead, so how would you define me? No, I mean… No. You can only define the dead because a human being means… See, for all other creatures, nature has fixed them, ninety percent of their life is fixed by nature. There is only ten percent latitude for those creatures to find expression to their own individual stuff. One tiger and another tiger, just ten percent latitude, that's all. But a human being comes unformed. Only ten percent is fixed by nature, ninety percent is in our hands. So if you define yourself, you must be already dead. I am not yet. Not at all <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> It's human being is a possibility. The problem with people is they are always try to identify themselves and others with the activity that they perform. So if I impart yoga, they say he is a yog he is a yogi. If I talk, they say he is a spiritual teacher. If I hit a ball, they say he is a golfer. If I fly an airplane, they say he is an aviator. If I paint a picture, they say I am a painter. Why should you be defined by the activity that you perform? Now, activities can be done in so many ways as… as it is needed in the world. So if I ride a motorcycle, I become a motorcyclist? No. Activity is according to the need of the hour. A human being should never be defined. Only after we are dead, somebody can define because the possibility is over. So wait for some more time before you define me. <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> I actually want to know what you think about yourself and I got to… Yes, so Where much. is the time for me to think about myself? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I wake up in the morning at about 5, 5.30, I pray, I think about my work. Um, so my life and my day is all about self-orientation, my family, my friends, my work family. Sometimes I feel it's all about myself because it's what I do, what I set to do. Sometimes I think it's self-love. Do you think self-love is selfish? Self-love? See, love is a, a certain emotion which can make two into one. Self-love means you're making one into two. Okay. <laughs> this is an individual, all right? An individual means not further divis divisible. Indivisible, this is. This is an individual. If you have two inside, you must either be schizophrenic or possessed <laughs> You must say you need either a psychiatrist or an exorcist <laughs> So… <laughs> so you mean I need a psychiatrist? No, no, maybe an exorcist yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the thing is this, see these things are going on in the world, it's become fashionable to every year come up with a new concept, a new concept. See what love means, it's the sweetness of your emotion. It's got nothing to do with anybody. 
You can sit here alone, lovingly, can you? Hello? Yes. You can sit here. It's not about anybody. If somebody comes, you can share. If nobody is here, can you sit here lovingly? If you do not know how to sit here lovingly by yourself, you need somebody to kickstart you all the time. <laughs> you are a pathetic life <laughs> So to be joyful, to be loving, to be peaceful, to be blissful, these are all the privileges invested in you. Yes, I agree. So you don't need anybody to start your peacefulness, your joyfulness, your blissfulness, your loving nature. You don't need any kick-starting from outside. This is like this. Well, in terms of what kind of uh, relationships or what we have formed with different people, if uh, your dog comes, you may do juju ju ju out of your love. If your child comes, you may take them on your lap. If your neighbor comes, you do this. Don't take them on your lap, okay <laughs> Even if the neighbor's attractive? Even if they're attractive, you can express your love in so many different ways <laughs> I'm looking at the next question why that I think you, I should ask you. Why are you copying questions? No, I'm not copying questions. I, I, was, I thought I would get very nervous, but I'm so mesmerized by what you say. So I want to ask you a question on glamour. Okay. They always say, oh, our work is very glamorous, we are, you know, it's glamour is many times considered frivolous. What do you think about glamour? I think uh, whatever is exuberant is glamorous. Mm -hmm. Sunrises, is it glamorous? Most people have not seen the sunrise. <laughs> Hello? Long time ago. <laughs> no, but happens. I wake up at 5 a.m., I see sunrise. <laughs> It happens every day, but most people have seen it long time ago or they see it on their phone screen, sunrise and sunset. It's very glamorous. Every moment of life, if you have enough attention, there is nothing in the universe which is not glamorous. I agree. It's just that people have no attention. This is a serious mistake our education systems have made. We have replaced attention with information. With information, every idiot looks like they're knowledgeable, at least they think so. Simply because they go on the Google and read up this and that and come, you know galaxy ZY Z64? What the hell is a galaxy? You don't know what it is, nobody has seen it, all right? Yes, it's somewhere there, but you know nothing about it. You know nothing about this one, how do you know galaxies? Anyway, Whatever even scientific… scientific perspective of what it is, you must understand, even science is dependent only on the human perception. Hello? It's only the way we see it, the way our eyes are made. Just go and have a conversation with a grasshopper next time you're… you see any grass. No, I… I'm, I don't mean that, I mean real grass. Yeah <laughs> I caught that <laughs> So, your grasshopper is seeing the world completely differently, he's got a very special eye structure. His visual structure is such, he's seeing things very, very differently. I have close interactions with certain creatures, especially cobras and stuff. They see life so very differently. And uh, what makes you think your way of seeing is everything? It is not. After all, if you look at this cosmos, the spread of this cosmos, nobody knows where it begins, where it ends. And in that, here we are sitting, we are not even a speck of dust and we're talking about all this. Isn't it fantastic? Yeah. Sitting on this tiny little mud ball which is spinning and hurtling through the space and the whole system is hurtling through something else that we don't even understand. Here we are sitting and making all kinds of conclusions about everything. So information is not the way forward for a humanity, attention. So I'm very happy with the artificial intelligence, machine learning coming up because uh, <laughs> all this rubbish about people remembering a few things and acting like they're smart will go away. <laughs> all the first rank holders will mean nothing <laughs> because uh, just… See, somebody reads one book and he becomes a representative of God. Yeah. Somebody reads ten books and he becomes a teacher, he can beat you with a stick. 
Somebody reads hundred books and they become professors and whatever, whatever, it me doesn't mean a damn thing because we… without keenness of attention, not a single door in the universe will ever open for you, ever. You don't know nothing about life unless you paid very keen attention to it. You know everything in a, a gloss way. If you're using the word glamour in terms of gloss… Yes. It's an unfortunate bubble <laughs> But <laughs> gloss is also a part of glamour. It's a… it's a sure way of missing life, too much gloss that you don't experience anything, you see only the surface of everything. This is happening because we have too much information about everything, no attention to anything. Here if you want to know a human being, you have to pay attention, hello? If you know all the information about this person, do you know that person? Do you really believe that? You need attention, isn't yeah. it, to experience anything. But unfortunately, modern education has done this, but what I see now is, you know, they were, they were inviting me to all these artificial intelligence conferences. Then I said, why are you inviting me to these things? I'm not artificial <laughs> intelligence. <laughs> why are you calling me? They said, no, no, uh, these are all academics and stuff. They said, we will not have a job in another twenty-five years. What should we do? I said, I'm glad you don't have a job because your job made me sick in the school. <laughs> your job of reading one book and talking about the same damn thing to me again, instead of teaching me how to read, you were reading it to me, that was no good. Religious leaders play, played this, now educationalists are playing this, parents are doing this all the time. All you have is a little bit of information. But today my phone carries a thousand times more information than you can ever pack in your head. I'm glad that machines are capable of this because now the only way out will be you have to pay attention, otherwise you'll go crazy. So you do endorse social media, it's a… it's a part of all our lives today, I think social media is something… What is there to endorse? Country. It's just gossip has gone global, what's my <laughs> problem <laughs> Entertainment too, it's well, entertaining. See, when I say gossip, I'm not speaking in negative terms because people always relied more on gossip than the official news channels of the times. Hello? Yes or no? Officially, if something is announced, you'll ask choo 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 choo, is it true? <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> always. So gossip is uh, very reliable and travels very fast. Now because of social media platforms and technologies, it's going across the world. I have no issue about it. I think still it is in a very juvenile state where silly things are happening. But I think people will mature, people will learn to filter through things and understand what is real, what is not real. I think already people are beginning to, but more maturity will come because it's new, it's just a few years old. There's also a lot of information that we get and quickly and super fast that's also beneficial in many a times. See, if you're thinking of only survival and enhancing your survival, information is important. Mm -hmm. But is your life about just making a living or is it life… You, is it about making a life out of this? If you want to make a life out of this, you need attention. If you're just trying to make a living, you need information. Information can be bought and sold, but attention opens up things that can either be bought or sold, it just enriches your life. Hmm. I have a question which I want to ask you. Before I go ahead, I wanted to ask you, what do you think about… Why did you discard all those questions? Because I've already asked them. Okay. I've already… St I've been studying, I've been nervous. Ever since Lavina spoke to me, I was like, oh my God, you want me to interview. So my team and me have been sitting on questions. In fact, the whole no, day I'm today… Not, I'm not as dangerous as I look. You're just fascinating. <laughs> Some of us marry our passion, some of us marry a person. According to you, what is better? See, uh <laughs> you'll make me very unpopular now. No. <laughs> <laughs> we have to have some fun. See, you use the word passion, maybe it's been used in many different ways. Yeah. 
Because passion means thick, people always think it's between two people. No, passion is the way you are. Passion is not about somebody else. You're passionate. Passionate means unbridled involvement, yes? So, people are only thinking, they… you know, all these… Uh, every word has been hijacked. If you say love, you think it's with somebody. If you say relationship, you think it is only one kind of body-based relationship. If you say passion, you think it's about somebody. No, these are all things about you, don't export it. This is about you, you must be loving, you must be passionate, you must be romantic. Romance does not mean somebody, passion does not mean somebody, love does not mean somebody, it means you. So in that context I am speaking, passion means you have an unbridled sense of involvement. If you have an unbridled sense of involvement, indiscriminate. If you see a flower, you're absolutely with it, you're absolutely with it. If you see an ant, you're with it. If you see a man or a woman, you're with it. A child, you're with it. If you look at the clouds, you're with it. If you're absolutely there, you are a passionate human being. I am a super passionate human being. If you are a super passionate human being, you are a yogi because you're… you have no sense of boundary for your involvement. If you have no sense of boundary, if your involvement is not bound by what is mine and what is not mine, you're just absolutely involved with everything that you're in touch with, we say you are in yoga because the word yoga means union. Yoga does not mean twisting and turning uh, and looking like a leftover noodle in the end. <laughs> so when you say passion, you're talking about yoga. But unfortunately, passion, people think, is only about towards somebody or something. That's a constipated passion. You still didn't answer the question about marriage. See, marriage means… because as I said earlier, human child comes unformed. Because of that, institution of marriage becomes very important. Because when man and woman come together, there is always a possibility of a child. Today there may be a choice, at one time there was no choice. It would just happen anyway, all right? Today there may be some choice and I hope everybody exercises that choice uh, <laughs> because, you know, we are not an endangered species anymore <laughs> So, marriage is institutionaliz institutionalization of a, a certain passion which started. The initial passion may not be by your choice, because you, uh, you know, you were hijacked by the… your intelligence was hijacked by your hormones, so you became passionate beyond yourself. So that has to be institutionalized because human children will be born. If you are bearing monkeys or buffaloes, there was no problem. Human children are born, they come unformed. Once a human child comes, it's a twenty-year project, that is if they do well. If they don't do well, they're lifelong projects. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, because it's a twenty-year project, we needed an institution. Without that institution, uh, there would be a disastrous situation. Uh, as uh, people grow up, by the time they become eighteen, a uh, lot of people are against marriage. Why marriage? We can just live together, this, that. But when they were two or three, they were not talking that. They desperately wanted their parents to be married and stable because they knew the joy of being there in a stable atmosphere, all right? So, because of the nature of human existence, institutionalizing certain aspects has become necessary. So, can you institutionalize passion? Never. You cannot institutionalize passion. You institutionalize a certain relationship because there are certain outcomes to it, social, biological and other outcomes to it which needs to be stabilized with an institution. Can you stabilize your passion with an institution? That will be a sad day <laughs> We're going to open this up for questions. If anybody is wanting to ask a question, there, is there a mic ready? Oh, there's a hand up there. Hari Om Sadhguruji. Oh. Um, I want to ask you a question on Krishna, ja Krishna Janmashmi. What does Krishna mean to you? Wonderful man, but long dead. <laughs> I'm saying, 
an exuberant, wonderful human being. Long time ago, if he inspires that exuberance in you today, fantastic. But if he's only hanging on your wall, you can use a more recent model. <laughs> if he's uh, bringing about that in you, that you become that passionate and exuberant about life, it's fine. But anyway, when we say Krishna, most people are only thinking about uh, butter, flute, girls. You must understand, all these things happened till he was sixteen years of age. After he was sixteen, he left that place, the Vrindavan. That's the last time he went there, he never went back. Either to the cowgirls or Radhe or he never played flute because he gave away his flute to her and he said, I'll never again play this. Nor were there cows around to eat butter. All these things, sixteen years of age. Till sixteen, what all can a man do, please? Be practical. So over thousands of years we exaggerate this because we are not able to come to terms with his life in so many different ways because he lived an unbridled life. Is he a good man, is he a bad man, lot of debates are happening. No, he is not a good man or bad man, he is a fantastic man. Fantastic he is. Is he good? Because I want you to understand your ideas of good and bad come from <laughs> your own sense of putting other people down in your mind. See, for example, I sit here and I think I am a very good man. How does this happen? He is not okay, she is not okay, he is not okay, she is not okay, he is not okay, she is not okay. Compared to all these people, I am a very good man. If I am the only man on this planet, would I know whether I am a good man or a bad man? Hello? If I had nobody to put down in my mind, would I know whether I am a good man or a bad man? But you would still know whether you are a joyful human being or a miserable human being. This is how you must see Krishna, a joyful human being in any given situation. You put him in love, you put him in war, you put him in all kinds of strife, joyful human being. Even in a battlefield, he's cracking jokes. That says a lot about the man, okay? If it ins… if he's inspiring that in you, that even when you have a little bit of war at home, not a gunfight but just like that, you know, when even pots and pans fly, if you are still joyful, well, celebrate Krishna, fantastic. But if he's just an emblem and you think you own him because you're born in India, very sad. No, you… you can… even when he was alive, nobody could own him. You can't own him now because you're born in this country. The… the essence of what it means to be Krishna is, he's an unbridled life, exuberant, no matter what. Life did not… life was not kind to them, all right? Hello? Life has not been kind to him, all kinds of extreme situations, and you must understand in the end whatever he aspired to do. The most important thing, from the age of sixteen, once his guru Sandipani gave him this commitment, he decided he wants to marry… no, no, don't think otherwise. He wanted to marry spiritual process with the political process of the day. He wanted all kings to become, you know, inf uh, infused with spirituality. What spirituality means is, Physicality means it is ruled by boundaries. This is my body, that's your body. These are two different boundaries. Do what you want, unless we are buried till then, this is my body, that's your body. This is my mind, that's your mind. This is my thing, that's your thing. But spirituality means once you transcend your physical nature, there are no boundaries. So he wants political people, political people of the day who are not presidents and prime ministers, they were kings. He wanted all the kings to have a spiritual process because if one who is in power, if he doesn't have a sense of profound sense of inclusiveness, he is bound to exploit. 
he is bound to exploit, there is simply no other way. He must have a profound sense of inclusiveness with everything and every... everybody around him. Only then he'll serve all life. Everybody put you up because they believe you will do something more than they themselves can do. Hello? Yes or no? Somebody puts you up because they believe you're going to do something that they themselves cannot do for their own lives. It's not a small responsibility, it's a fantastic thing. Today we have the option to elect and put people up there. Well, we may have all kinds of uh, commentaries going on, political process, but this is what it means. So he wanted to make sure those who are in political power have a sense of inclusiveness, have an experience of inclusiveness. So, did it work out? No, it ended up in a terrible, disastrous battle. So I'm saying, his whole mission was a failure. His own people fought among themselves and killed, e killed each other. They killed each other, all brothers killed brothers, and they even killed children. Sleeping children they went out and killed. So I'm saying his whole mission was a total failure, but he still remained joyful and exuberant, not affected by what happens there. So this is because a human being is about his own physical and psychological process. Because your physiological and psychological drama is your drama. Life is of a different nature. What you call as my body is an accumulation of what you have eaten. What you call as my mind is an accumulation of impressions that you've gathered. These accumulations do not define in any way what this life is about. This is the essence of Krishna. He is demonstrating it in every moment of his life. If you have any doubt about it, doesn't matter what conclusion you make about him, he proves it wrong and proves it wrong and proves it wrong because he is not going by any script. His exuberant life, this is how life should be. And it's wonderful, after five five thousand whatever number of years that this culture still remembers and celebrates a man who lived over five thousand years ago. That's fantastic for ourselves <laughs> Namaskar Sadhguru, I see you as the most logical person, most logical guru in the country today. How have you been able to achieve that? Whatever that's supposed to mean <laughs> Well, <laughs> see, uh, you must understand this. Many times I'm sure every one of you gets into argument with somebody. Hello? When you get into an argument with somebody, it's simply because you think they are illogical and stupid and whatever, all right? But you must understand, the person who is arguing with you also thinks that they are logically correct. Yes or no? Hello? You think they are arguing because they think they are wrong? No, they think they are logically correct. So you must understand, logic is a very deceptive thing. People can make anything look logical. People want to kill you and they think it's logically correct. Hello? <laughs> yes or no? People are bombing the whole nations out, they think it's logically correct. They do horrendous things to each other and they think it's logically correct. So don't put me in that category <laughs> So, logic must evolve. How will logic evolve? The more profound your experience of life is, the more evolved your logic is. Rudimentary logic is going on all the time. Hello? Ugly things in the world don't happen because of illogic. Ugly things in the world happen because of rudimentary logic, isn't it? So you think he's not logical? The man who does terrible things to somebody, the man who kills, the man who rapes, the man who does things, you think he's not logical? He's very logical. In his own rudimentary sense, he's got his own logic going, isn't it? So it's very important don't try to evolve your logic by reading Socrates or something, it's very rudimentary. 
if your life's experience becomes very profound, it'll only become profound if your experience of life is not determined by the boundaries of your body or your mind, then your experience of life becomes very profound. Once again, I'm telling you, you need to know some yoga. Tch. Yoga means not twisting yoga. Yoga means union that... See, all of you breathing, hello? Yes. No, because you're in Delhi, I'm asking <laughs> I thought maybe you learn to survive without breathing and something like that <laughs> If you're breathing, what you exhale, the trees are inhaling. What the trees exhale, you're inhaling. This is yoga, there's a union. One half of your lungs is hanging out there. If actually, if you experience this, right now, I'm logically telling you, it's a fact, isn't it? Hello? Is it a fact? Before photosynthesis started in this world, some approximately a billion years ago, some six hundred and eight hundred million years ago, one very smart algae or a fungi, we don't know which one, one of them, it's like we don't know whether it is a cave man or a cave woman who first learned to control and use fire for cooking. Do you really know? Because there is no cave woman anywhere, only cave man. Caveman usually means a rudimentary man, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe women were never rudimentary <laughs> At least they thought so <laughs> So, uh, we don't know. Similarly, we don't know whether it's an algae or a fungi, but one of them came up with this fantastic idea of cooking their food using the perpetual energy of the sun. Today, we call this phenomena as photosynthesis. Before photosynthesis came, the oxygen level in the Earth's atmosphere was a shade over one percent. Today it's twenty-one percent, even in Delhi. It's twenty-one percent. Because of that, we are alive. We are not only alive because of that, we evolved because of that. Complex life on this planet evolved only because as the oxygen concentration in the atmosphere improved, then the evolution happened. So, this process of photosynthesis, the way it happened and where we are today, is a logical process. But in the last thousand years, we have removed eighty-five percent of the photosynthesis on the planet. But we are still logical, isn't it? <laughs> we have logic as to why we remove it, yes or no? Eighty-five percent of the oxygen manufacturing Plants on this planet we have removed, but we have done this in a logically correct way, yes or no? Hello? Somebody had a logic for that, yes or no? Yes. Because there is no profoundness of experience. If you experienced that half of your lungs is hanging out there, do I have to tell you don't cut it? So there is no profoundness of experience. Unless there is profoundness of experience, most intelligent people will do most idiotic and cruel things in the world. I want you to understand, it's very intelligent or intellectually sharp people who developed smart bombs, all right? So what smart bomb means is, there's no window anywhere, but if there is a small vent somewhere, through that they can drop a bomb here from two miles up in the sky and all of us can evaporate. What is so smart about it, I don't understand. What is so smart about making people evaporate who don't even know where the hell what is coming at them, but it's a smart bomb. So there is a logic to that smartness, yes or no? So please understand, your logic can be most destructive if it is not inclusive. An inclusiveness will not happen because you say, I love you, you love me. It will only happen when there is a profound sense of experience of life. When I say profound sense of experience, your existence here is not happening on an individual basis. This life is happening as one whole phenomena. You're just a small individual outcrop. Just because nature has given you this privilege of having individual experience in this limitless space, of existence. Let me put it this way, 
The problem is here. See, in this cosmos, this uh, solar system is a tiny speck. In that tiny speck, planet Earth is a micro speck. In that micro speck, India is a super micro speck. In that micro, super micro speck, Delhi is a super, super micro speck. In that, you are a big man. This is a serious problem. <laughs> From this evolves all kinds of logic, which is destructive and self-destructive in so many ways. So if logic has to evolve into a place where it doesn't damage this life or any other life, it's important your life or your experience of life has to become profound. It has to go beyond your physical and psychological boundaries. Pranam, uh, it's a lifetime look. opportunity to possibly address and talk to you. Uh, my question is, sir, life is a long journey. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's been so far. <laughs> How do we really know that we have fallen for love and this is it? This is the final one. Do we apply logic to it or do we feel love as love? Who is that? <laughs> Am I seeing the other also? No. <laughs> How do we really know, sir, that this is it? We have fallen for it. Th okay. This is love. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sit down, please. <laughs> Let's see, yeah. Uh, if life is feeling very long, this is not it <laughs> See, on a certain day, on a certain day when you are very happy, very joyful, twenty-four hours, poof, goes off like a moment, isn't it? Another day you're a little, you know, I don't want to put a word to it, <laughs> but you know that. On that day, twenty-four hours feels like a thousand years. So only miserable people can have a long life. <laughs> if you're bursting with love and joy, this goddamn life will be over before you know what the hell is happening. You must always die before you know what it is <laughs> Because that means you're living a full life. Oh, you figured out life is like this, God sent me here and I'm going back to heaven and I'll sit in his lap. If you know all this, what the hell are you doing here, you must go today <laughs> If you definitely know you're going to heaven, going to sit in God's lap, should you not go today before I go there? Isn't it? Yeah. So, if his life is feeling like a long journey, this not it. And don't get into this mess. Oh, is this the person who is the real thing? Is that the person the real one for me? No, I'm a, I want you to understand, this is the one. If you fix this one, everybody feels wonderful. If you fix this one person, you will see everybody feels wonderful. If you try to fix that one, that one, that one, you will realize life will become a mess. So my self-love? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Not self-love <laughs> Love means uh, transactional, yeah. you know, there's a transaction to it. So transaction can happen only between two. Yeah. But love is a certain exuberance of your emotion sweetness of your emotion. Let me put it this way. See, if your body becomes pleasant, we call this health. You want it? You want it? See, I'm going to bless you. Those who say yes, those who say no, those who are silent, I'm going to bless you for whatever you are. <laughs> you want health? Yes. yes. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it pleasure. Don't feel shy, tell me. <laughs> Blessed. <coughs> if your mind becomes pleasant, we call this peace. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it joy. If your emotions become pleasant, we call this love. 
if it becomes very pleasant, we call it compassion. If your very life energies become pleasant, we call this blissfulness. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. If your surroundings become pleasant, see you're busy with something else. You ask me a love question, this is it or not, what is this? <laughs> if your surroundings become pleasant, we call it success. Only to make your surroundings pleasant, you need the cooperation of people and forces around you. But to make this body pleasant, to make this mind pleasant, emotions pleasant, energy pleasant, is one hundred percent your business. So now, when you talk about, I am in love with this person, is this it or not? You're talking about making your surroundings pleasant, not about making this one pleasant. If this one is pleasant, surroundings, little this way, that way, is all fine, it's an adventure. But if this one is unpleasant, you want the surroundings should be in an ideal condition and that'll never happen because surroundings will always be in so many different ways. Is there going to be one person in your life will… who will be one hundred percent the way you want them? Nobody. Nobody will ever be. They were talking about Krishna. Krishna's two wives were always complaining. <laughs> Hello? Today we are worshipping him as to what a great and grand human being he is. But his wives were complaining because even they found even he was not perfect for them because nobody is. But nobody will ever happen the way you want them to be hundred percent. But this one person must happen, isn't it? If this person… one person happened the way you want him to be, will you keep him loving, joyful, blissful? Hello? Will you? Yes, outside we manage to the best of our ability. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Still, you're old enough, you… even your hair is grey, you're asking a schoolboy question <laughs> Only high school boy thinks there is some perfect girl somewhere <laughs> uh, Namaskar, Sadhguru. Uh, Sadhguru, how do we get to profoundly experience… Get to? Profoundly experience… Profound in life. Yes. experience. Oh. <laughs> See, uh, what is it that is constipating your experience? Do, don't… see this whole thing, when I say constipation, you're thinking of only one thing <laughs> Constipation means there is no free flow, it happens little by little. Your joy is happening little by little, your love is happening little by little, your peace is happening little by little, everything is happening little by little, so this is a constipated life. Why has it become constipated? Because you have set conditions. If I have to be happy, you must be like this, I must… that should be like this, my clothing should be like this, the world should be like that. You have set too many conditions which can ever come together for anybody. Even I was just saying, even Krishna's wives have problems because he's not fitting into the conditions they have set. Today he think he's… The, you are… he is the most fantastic human being after five thousand years. But when he was alive, he was not fitting into the definitions. The first question was about definition. Somebody or something, your situation, your work, your life is not fitting into your definition. Definition is a constipation because life cannot be defined, it's a phenomena beyond any definition. All kinds of idiots have been gi giving definitions for life for thousands of years, but there is no definition to it because it's a phenomena beyond your grasp. You can only experience it, you can ride it or you can be crushed by it. This is the choice you have. It is a, a great phenomena. If you learn to ride it, it's fantastic. If you don't learn to ride it, it crushes you, it's not so fantastic. It's like this. See, suppose you are a… what… you know, a surfing champion, you know how to surf big waves. Tsunami is your dream, isn't it? Hello? Yes or no? 
Tsunami is your dream, you would like to ride that wave, hundred feet tall wave is what you want to ride. But it's a disaster for everybody else because they don't know how to ride. The same thing with every aspect of life. Have you become life competent or are you just a psychological case? When I say a psychological case, you have conclusions, conclusions, conclusions about everything, how, what, everything should happen. Now if it doesn't fit into your conclusion, you're miserable. So essentially, you're trying to fit the whole world or creation itself into the framework of your constipated idea of what it should be. If you do not create anything, if you do not define any aspect of life, that you're willing to experience it, how do I experience it? Immediately your modern self-help people came and said, be in the moment <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm… I'm asking you, can you be somewhere else and show me, please? You can only be in the moment, can you be somewhere else? No, but then what… what teaching is that to say be in the moment? Essentially… essentially they are telling you, don't use your brain. Do not remember the past, do not think about the future, then you are heading for a real disaster, all right <laughs> If you don't use your memory and your imagination, then you are heading for a disaster. Right now, this is the biggest problem, that your life is nurtured in such a way there is no distinction between what is memory and what is imagination. If you put these two things into proper boxes, your memory and your imagination, what imagination means is, you can use your memory and use permutations and combinations and create an exaggerated sense of anything you want. It's perfectly fine because that's a human privilege that we can imagine things which cannot even happen, all right? We can imagine things that cannot even happen, never happened before, may not happen ever, but we can imagine that also, it's fantastic. But once there is no distinction between what is memory and what is imagination, the present moment's experience is clouded between these two. So you cannot experience anything profoundly because first of all, you cannot see anything clearly without clarity of vision there is no profoundness of experience. And there will be no clarity of vision if you do not know what is memory and what is happening right now and what I can imagine for a tomorrow, if there is no distinction. This is a fundamental thing that there is no discipline in one's life to clearly separate memory and imagination so that this moment's experience is absolutely clear the way it is. Do I have to tell you yoga, this nonsense, that nonsense, world is one nonsense? If you breathe, you know it's all one, isn't it? Hello? Yes or no? Yes. And how come you do not know? Because your psychological mess is going on. Memory is playing up all the time, imagination is playing up all the time because there is no separation between the two. There is a lot we can talk about why this has happened but there are specific things that you can do, simple sadhana that you can do in your life where distinctly you can put your memory in your memory box, imagination in your imagination box, both of them are fantastic because if we did not have memory, we would not know the richness of our life, isn't it? Suppose I wipe out all your memory, what is there? There's really nothing. And if there was no memory, there would be no imagination either. So this moment, how we experience it, is profoundly influenced by memory. It gives us a context, but if it seeps into this moment, then you cannot experience this. So this is not a philosophy or an ideology, it's a method with which you bring this discipline to your mind, that your memory and your imagination are separated, you don't have to do anything about now because it's the way it is. You can't do anything about it. You just have to drink this moment in, there's nothing to do. It will not happen because you believe in this philosophy. You must bring the discipline of keeping memory in its memory box. If you do that, imagination will naturally fall into its box. Then here, what you need to experience will be crystal clear. Without clarity, there will be no profoundness. Oh. I don't wear designer clothes, I design my own clothes <laughs>
That's why I love your style. <laughs> We're just honoring you with the show. Thank you. You look like you forgot who I am. I am a yogi, not a king. Huh? <laughs> You're a king for us. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for this wonderful experience. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. On behalf of Sutra Santati, then now next, and Abhiraj Baldota Foundation, we would like to thank Sadhguru and Manish Malhotra for being here and for this enthralling evening. We would also like to thank the National Museum and the Ministry of Culture for all their support. A big thank you to the press for being here, for supporting this endeavor. This incredible exhibition would not have been possible without the passion and the hard work of all the co-creators. A big thank you to them too. And last but not the least, thank you to all of you, the audience, for participating, for being here uh, wholly and solely. Thank you. Namaskaram. <laughs>